What's up guys, thanks for stopping by, I hope you're doing good. This land has been out a little while now, and some players like me have already played the update quite a lot on the test branch. However, there's so much new stuff in this update to familiarise yourself with that it's easy to miss little details. And so, understandably, most videos are only covering one specific topic. And I know both for new players and experienced players alike, it can be kind of frustrating to learn as much as possible about this absolutely epic update. So, that's why this video is the massive Mislands Valheim guide. Rather than rushing this one out, I've put a ton of time and effort into covering everything in this update, from the big details to the small ones, so that hopefully this is the only video you need to see to learn everything about the Mislands update. So strap in, it's gonna be a long one. I hope you enjoy this video. If you do, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for future content. Let's jump into it. Okay, so I'm firstly just gonna quickly list all of the topics I'm going to cover in this video very briefly and just let you know that this video is gonna be fully timestamped. So you can jump to any specific topic within the video if you just wanna learn about that. Okay, let's make this quick. I'm gonna talk about how to get to the Mistlands and if you need to create a new world, what it looks like, how to deal with the mist, how to progress and unlock the boss, what all the mobs look like and how to deal with them, how to deal with the dwarves. I'm going to give you some tips on clearing dungeons. I'm going to tell you about the new forge and all of the new weapons and armor. I'm going to provide you with some tips and a little bit of a guide of how to deal with the new boss. I'm going to tell you what the new boss power does. I'll show all the build pieces, trader changes, the new farming you can do, the new fishing, new cooking, new meads, new skills skills, new hairstyles and beards, emotes, music, events, characters, base defenses, resources, plus any little miscellaneous changes in the update that don't fit in any of the above categories. So to access the Mistlands, you just need to travel further out from the middle towards the edges of the map. If you're playing on an old world, areas of the map that were previously unexplored will still spawn the new Mistlands biome. However, old Mistlands that you have explored will not change into the new version of Mistlands. So you can continue playing on your old world just fine. However, if you've explored the whole map, or close to it, you may have a better experience by starting over. And it's also worth noting that the world generation has been slightly changed, so new worlds have a lot more mistlands, and they pretty much just spawn in like a donut shape around the edges of the world. So if that sounds appealing to you, and you want to explore a lot more mistlands on your world, then maybe even then you may want to start a new world, even if you didn't fully explore your old one. The biome looks incredible. The fog wall on the outside is super cool looking, and it's a really cool way to be able to tell you're about to enter a mistlands when you're on the edge of the biome. The crazy mountains and cliffs are just so cool and epic looking and in general i think the graphics and the design especially the architecture is just super cool in this biome however it is of course very misty to deal with the mist you're going to want to make a wisp light you can craft the wisp light on a normal workbench however it requires one wisp and one silver ingot to get the wisp you're going to need to make a wisp fountain wisp fountains are made with 10 stone one torn spirit and require a stone cutter and torn spirits are now what you get for defeating your glove. Once you place down your wisp fountain at night time wisps will be attracted to it and once they're flying around the fountain you can simply walk up to them and collect them and no you can't get wisps by deconstructing any of the wisp torches that you see scattered around mistlands. The wisp light itself clears an area of mist around your character that makes it much easier to travel and in particular makes it easier to fight within the mist however it does doesn't give you a huge field of view and so spotting things at a distance are still a challenge. To deal with this, I highly recommend that the main way you traverse a misland, especially when you just enter it, is by using your Ekthir ability and scaling every single mountain and cliff that you find in the mistlands. because once you get to high ground, you can be above the clouds of mist and from there be able to spot various points of interest, including the various dwarven guard towers, dungeons and boss entrances. And even if you can't can't, spotting another cliff or another mountain and heading to that is a good way to travel because eventually you will find a cliff that will allow you to see something useful. One of the new swords, the Mist Walker, which I will cover later,
later in the video, also does a similar job to the Wisp Light. It clears a tiny area of mist around your character. However, it does have less of an effect compared to the Wisp Light, and you may have to zoom in your camera to even notice that there is less mist. The last tip I'm going to give you about dealing with mist is that you can actually place the new Wisp Torches wherever you want to clear a big area of mist, much like the Wisp Light. These require one Yggdrasil Wood and one Wisp, but if you're willing to grind out all the mats with these torches, you can hypothetically clear an entire biome of mist, which will make it extremely easy to travel and give you that large field of view. Wisps are pretty easy to grind for, so I suspect Yggdrasil Wood will be the bottleneck here, but if you put the time in, this is definitely possible. Let's talk about progression. The way progression is handled in the Mistlands update is actually awesome. So just like every other boss in the game, you need to find the Veg Vizier that reveals the location of the biome boss and the Veg Vizier for the Queen is hidden inside the biome's dungeons which are called infested mines. There's two different types of entrances for infested mines. One is in the form of an abandoned dwarven god tower which can have a wisp light outside giving away its location which is mostly easy to separate from a dwarven god tower by the fact that it's covered in enemies. You can find the entrance to the dungeon in the basement of these infested god towers. The other entrance entrance type is this huge stairwell leading into the side of a cliff which can sometimes be harder to spot but is easily identifiable once you realize this giant stairwell doesn't really appear anywhere else. Once inside, much like finding the elder rune inside a burial chamber, it just takes a lot of trial and error to find a dungeon that contains the rune. It is quite rare but I'm happy to say it's nowhere near as rare as the Yagloth rune so as long as you keep fully clearing out these dungeons you will definitely find the queen's location eventually. Now this is where things get interesting. Even when you get to the boss location, you cannot instantly summon the boss as the queen actually resides within her own type of dungeon that requires a special kind of key to get inside. This key is called a seal breaker and one of the really cool aspects of this key is that it has to be crafted. Whilst exploring dungeons, you actually find these fragments inside these little glass boxes and if you smash the glass, you can loot these fragments and it takes nine of them to craft the seal breaker and once you've crafted the seal breaker you can now unlock the gate to access the boss one of the other really cool twists is that this boss actually already starts spawned in so you will actually just stumble across the queen by exploring this dungeon and she can actually be waiting for you right near the entrance or sometimes she can be hiding somewhere at the top so it actually adds a really cool twist. And by the way, just because she starts spawned in does not mean that you can't resummon the boss. Right at the top of the infested citadel, which is the name of this dungeon where the queen resides, there is an altar that can be used to resummon the boss. This requires three seeker soldier trophies, which is actually quite an expensive requirement. Anyway, we're getting too far ahead of ourselves. Another huge twist to gain an entrance to the boss room is the fact that the crafting of the seal breaker requires a gold a table and crafting that is a whole ordeal in itself so let's get to that okay so this is the gold a table and to craft it you need 20 Yggdrasil wood 10 black metal 5 black cores and 5 ether and the gold a table is used to make the seal breaker as I mentioned before but it's also used for all the new magical items like the new cape the new robes all three of the staffs and the dead riser we're going to cover all of these shortly, but let's first focus on the mats. So black metal self-explanatory, you find the black cores inside the dungeons, which we will talk more about later. Yggdrasil wood we'll also talk more about later on when we get on to talking about resources, but the refined ether is where things get particularly interesting. There is also an upgrade you can craft to the gold table as well, by the way, it's called the rune table. Both these things look so cool together. And to make the rune table, you need 10 black marble, 5 Yggdrasil wood and 10 refined ether. So to make refined ether, you're going to need to make one of these. This is an ether refinery. To make the refinery, you're going to need 20 black marble, 5 black metal, 10 Yggdrasil wood, 5 black cores and 3 sap. Once you've made your refinery, you then take some sap and some soft tissue and you place the sap in the bottom and the soft tissue in the top and it will start to create refined ether. However, during the process, 
you can see these little laser beams of ether get shot out of the refinery. And this does actually damage most things that it touches. And if you pay attention to the refined ether that comes out the bottom, each ball of ether also generates more of these beams that deal damage to the surroundings. So the more ether you have piled up here, the more damage it will do. However, you may notice that when these ether beams reach the black marble, the damage value coming off the bricks says zero. So this means that these beams don't damage black marble, which gives you an awesome reason to build a structure similar to this or by whatever design you like to house your refinery so you don't damage your base. I absolutely love this feature because it incentivizes more building and in some cases they require a little more creativity. Okay, so just to prove what I was talking about, I built this other facility for a refinery that's just encased in stone. And you're gonna see once it gets going, that look, the stone actually takes 30 damage, which doesn't seem like a lot, but particularly when you realize that this is actually enough to start destroying huge blocks of your structure and will eventually bring the building down. In fact, if you do this, you will definitely see some damage. We're going to try and prove that to you now. Okay, so this is the amount of damage done just from one batch of refined ether. So as you can see, it's pretty substantial. So you're definitely going to want to cover this in black marble. Okay, so that's how the refinery works. Now let's talk about the sap and the soft tissue required to create the refined ether. To get sap, you need to place a sap extractor on one of the ancient roots that stick out of the ground in the mistlands. Over time, these extractors will automatically drain the ancient roots of sap and each root does eventually get depleted. And as it depletes, it gradually takes longer and longer to extract the sap. However, if you then remove the extractor from the root, eventually it will recharge. Crafting a sap extractor requires 10 hydrosol wood, 5 black metal, and 1 diverga extractor. You find the extractor inside these dwarven settlements that are scattered across the mistlands. Inside the dwarven structure, you're looking for one of these chests, and if you destroy it, you get the extractor. I actually have already made a video where I show all of the extractor locations in all of the different structure types. So I'll leave a link in the description to that video if you're interested in that. But breaking these chests will actually alert the dwarves and make them attack you. And I'll cover how to take out all the dwarves later on in the video. But as you can see, you find the extractor on the inside. So that's how you get the sap to make ether. Soft tissue can actually be found inside these chests within dwarven structures. And it can also be found inside the giant skulls of petrified bone as the inside of these skulls actually still contains the brain of the giant and that is what the soft tissue actually is it's the brain matter of these ancient giants these giant heads are the best source of soft tissue but it's still surprising how much you can get from chests in dwarven structures too it's also interesting to note that the dwarven extractor can't be teleported so that means your sap extractors are going to require you to actually go out and sail to mistlands to place them every time so anyway that's how you get the mats required to make ether that will then allow us to make a golder table that allows us to make the seal breaker after collecting nine fragments that we can then use to unlock the door to fight the boss okay so since we talked about the golder table let's also talk about the other crafting station added with the mistlands update the black forge the Black Forge is used to craft the vast majority of new items in the update, aside from the magical ones as discussed earlier. And to craft it, you just need 10 black marble, 10 Idrisil wood, and 5 black cores. And it too has an upgrade called the Black Forge Cooler, which can be crafted with 5 iron, 5 copper, and 4 black marble. So we're now going to talk about all of the new weapons and armor that you can craft. But before I do, I just want to explain that the Bile Bomb and the Wisp Light are crafted on a workbench. And the new Black Metal Pick is actually crafted on a forge. But everything else 
that we're about to discuss is mostly crafted on the Black Metal Forge, unless it's magic related, in which case it's crafted on the Golder Table. So let's jump into the items, let's go. So as you can see, lots of prep went into this video. <laughs> Because these are all the items we're going to talk about. So we've got a lot to get through here. So let me fire through them real quick. Just so we can get through them all. And if they do something particularly interesting. I'll spend a little bit more time on it. Just to demonstrate. So we've got the new pole arm. The Himin Affle. This is just like all the other pole arms. Except it actually does lightning damage. As you can see by its really cool secondary attack. And to make it, you need 10 Yggdrasil wood, 15 ether, 5 silver, and 2 mandible. Which are dropped from some of the mobs we're going to cover later on. Next up is the carapace spear. This works just like a normal spear. It requires 10 Yggdrasil wood, 4 carapace, and 2 mandible. Carapace are dropped by seekers. And just to make it super clear, anything that's dropped from a mob will be covered later in the video we're going to do a whole section on mobs then we've got the spine snap bow which actually deals a little bit of spirit damage and to craft that you need 10 fine wood 40 bone fragments and 10 refined ether this bow looks super cool by the way next up is one of my personal favorites the demolisher which works like all the other sledgehammers it requires 10 idrisil wood 20 iron and 10 refined ether this one also looks particularly cool in my opinion and this is what the attack looks like then we've got all of the new arrows and bolts for the crossbow plus missiles for the ballista we'll cover those new weapons later on all of these just require exactly what you would expect which is basically the material the arrow is named after plus some feathers so we've got the carapace arrow the carapace bolt the black metal bolt the iron bolt the bone bolt and then for the ballista a wooden missile and the black metal missile then we've got the jotun bane which is actually a type of axe that deals poison damage and this requires five Yggdrasil wood 15 iron three bio bags and 10 ether then we've got the Krom, which is a giant two-handed greatsword. It requires 30 iron, 20 bronze, and 5 scale hide. And you get these by killing the hares just scattered around the Mistlands. This one I feel like is worth showing off because of how massive it is. Next up is the Mistwalker, which is actually a sword that deals frost damage. And it also emits a little bit of light, as we discussed earlier. This one requires 3 fine wood, 15 iron, 10 ether, and 3 wisps. It actually has this cool glowing effect. Then there's the dual knives, which require 4 fine wood, 10 iron, and 10 black metal. These are an awesome upgrade for people that like the knife combat in the game. Then there's the lantern, which requires 2 bronze, 1 certain core, and one crystal these are actually extremely underrated we're going to talk more about lanterns later when we get onto build pieces but the reason they're underrated is because they never go out then we've got the crossbow which requires 10 wood 8 iron and 4 root i should demonstrate how this works as it is actually quite different to bows as you see when you equip it you have to wait for it to load and then when you pull the trigger, it just instantly shoots. This actually makes it particularly useful for hunting, in my opinion. I also feel like it's worth noting that I think it's really cool that this incentivizes you to farm some more abominations. Because abominations are one of my favorite enemies in the game. Alright, next we've got the black metal pickaxe, which requires Yggdrasil wood and 25 black metal. We'll mention this thing a little bit later on. Okay, so now we get onto the staffs, which are super cool. This is the frost staff. To make this, you're going to need 20 Yggdrasil wood, 
four freeze glands and 15 refined ether. So the way all of the magical items work that require ether usage is they require you to eat a special recipe that adds an ether bar on top of your stamina bar that is essentially just a mana gauge. We're going to cover all new food recipes later on. But so long as you're eating some magical food, when you're firing the staff, you can see it drains the new ether bar. This frost staff is one of my personal favorites. Then we've got the protection staff. To make that, you're going to need 20 Yggdrasil wood, 4 blood clots, and 15 refined ether. And that is what this spell looks like. And this barrier will actually protect you in battle. Then we've got the Dead Razor. And to craft that, you're going to need 20 Yggdrasil Wood, 10 Bone Fragments, 15 Ether, and 1 Ranted Remains Trophy. So it's nice to see another use for trophies. This item essentially adds Necromancy to Valheim because it allows you to summon Skeletons. At level 1, you can summon 1. And at level 2... You can summon another skeleton. So you just saw at level 1. They actually destroyed the skeleton we had. And spawned another one. But now it's at level 2. We can have two skeletons. Then we've got the fire staff. This requires 20 Yggdrasil wood. 4 certling cores. And 15 ether. And this is what this attack looks like. Next up is the Bile Bomb. This requires one sap, one bile bag, and three resin. These Bile Bombs act exactly the same as Ooze Bombs, except the area of effect is fire. Then we've got the two new shields, which are the Carapace Buckler and the Carapace Shield. The normal shield does still allow parrying, but the Buckler actually just has a 2.5 parry bonus. To make the buckler, you need 10 carapace, 3 scale hide, and 10 ether. And for the normal shield, it's the same recipe, except it requires 20 carapace. Next up, we've got armors. This is the ether weave armor set. Each piece, both the torso and the leg pieces, only have a minus 2% movement speed. But they also have a plus 40% ether regen. And the hood has a plus 20% ether regen. So these are super important for people that want to use a lot of magic. And I think this is the best looking armor set in the update. The hood requires 15 linen thread, 15 ether, and 2 iron. The robe requires 20 linen thread, 20 refined ether, 10 feathers, and 5 hide. And the trousers require 20 linen thread, 20 refined ether, and 10 scale hide. This is the other armor set, which is the carapace armor set. It decreases movement speed by 5%. And each slot gives you 32 armor at level 1. This is what it looks like. The helmet requires 15 carapace, 3 scale hide, 2 mandible, and 5 refined ether. And both the chest and the low pieces require 20 carapace, 3 scale hide, 5 iron, and 10 refined ether. Last but not least, we've got the feather cape. This is one of the most epic things in the whole update. It does still make you resistant to frost like the other capes, but it also completely removes fall damage and limits your fall speed to 5 meters a second. To make this, you need 10 feathers, 5 scale hide, and 20 refined ether. But check out just how epic this is. No fall damage whatsoever. So cool. It's finally a cure for the glass ankle disease that apparently all Vikings suffer from. I just wanted to add this on after the fact to let you guys know there is currently a patch that's on the public test that might end up in the main game that changes some of these recipes a little bit. It makes the carapace armor helmet require 16 carapace, 
three scale hide, two mandible, and four ether. And the chest and leg pieces require 20 carapace, three scale hide, five iron, and four ether. It also changes the ether weave hood to require 16 thread and 15 ether and two iron. And it also changes all of the staffs, including the dead riser. So it makes the fire staff require 20 ectrasil wood, four cores and 16 ether. The dead riser, it makes it require 10 bone, 16 ether and four skeleton trophies. It makes the protection staff require 20 ectrasil wood, four blood clots and 16 ether. It makes the frost staff require 20 ectrasil wood, four freeze glands, and 16 ether and it also changes the carapace buckler to require 16 carapace three scale hide and 10 ether maybe this change won't happen but i just wanted to let you guys know just in case to avoid any confusion okay so that's it for all of this weapon and armor now let's jump into the mob showcase okay so first up we've got the seeker um the way i would recommend taking on seekers is just to use your bow and mostly just use frost arrows they seem to be the most effective on them but any of the elemental effects are good for Seekers with arrows. You can actually see that they drop Seeker Meat and Carapace. I also just want to show that it's also really effective to just parry them. And then just attack with whatever the best one-handed weapon is that you've got. I recommend the Black Metal Sword or the Frosner. But anything you're highly leveled up in that's fully upgraded will work for this. Next up, we've got the Seeker Brute. I recommend using the bow and arrow for this as well. Uh, mostly just frost arrows also, but again, other elemental damage is good to get more uh, DPS of the ticks. One thing special to note about this enemy is that it does have a weak spot, which is on the back. You see if we shoot the back of the enemy, you get yellow damage, which means that it's a weak spot. You can also parry with this enemy um, and get some decent damage that way. But uh, pairing the parry with the weak spot is also kind of good. So you can just run around to the back. You see that it's actually a lot of damage. But overall, I'd recommend just keeping your distance, particularly if you're struggling with it. And just uh, shooting it with a bow and arrow. And trying to shoot it in its weak spot on the back. Even if you can't hit the weak spot. Just keep you shooting it with arrows. And any elemental. Does actually work really good. Seeker soldiers drop mandible. Seeker meat. And carapace. So they're actually a really good source for mats. It's also worth noting that if you just get up on an area. That it can't reach. You can actually just rain down a ton of damage really safely. You can combine bile bombs with ooze bombs to get extra damage ticks. And this is also a really effective way, especially if you're just in safety. Using a sledgehammer weapon from safety also works, but it's just not as effective. Next up, we've got the Yarls. The Yarls also have a weak spot, which is this underbelly here. You see the little bubbles on the bottom? We get yellow damage every time we shoot that. Um, obviously, they fly, so ranged attacks with the arrows are going to work good. Frost arrows, again, seem particularly good. But yeah, if you just keep shooting it from underneath, you actually do deal quite a lot of damage. You can also just keep your distance and keep firing arrows at them. You'll be all right. But aiming for the underbelly is really the best bet. And Yarls drop Bile Bags. Alright, next up we've got Ticks because Yarls will cause them to spawn in as well. When they grab you, you can use the Pole Arm to immediately insta-kill any Ticks that are attached to you. It's a great way of dealing with this enemy. And Ticks drop Blood Clots. Next up is Hairs. Uh, hairs are actually really fast, so I recommend trying to sneak up on them and just shoot them with your bow. They can be quite hard to see though, obviously. But even if you have to chase them down, it's not too bad. And uh, hair actually drops scale hide and hair meat. All right, so next up is uh, Seeker Broods. Broods actually start in eggs. 
uh, and they fly out at you really quickly. So I recommend being ready with a high DPS weapon. So you'll see they'll fly out and they're actually really low HP. So just spamming whatever high DPS weapon you have, I recommend some sort of knife. Um, you don't even have to have the best knife for this. Lots of the knives in the game work really good. It's also worth noting that another way of dealing with this enemy is just by throwing bombs on the eggs before they pop out. And you can do this from range. This is a super effective way of dealing with Seeker Broods. And this enemy drops Royal Jelly. All right, now let's talk about dungeons. First of all, you're always kind of in danger in the Mistlands. So one thing you can do to make sure you're safe when you're going into a dungeon is to start out by placing a workbench and then putting down a stone cutter. And then you can actually use that to deconstruct all of the black marble around the stairs, even around the entrance a little bit. Uh, and then you can start to make it more difficult for enemies to come in and attack you. You can then use some of this black marble to block the way so that enemies can't get down to you. So you see now we've got a pretty good barricade. Then in this spot, you can always place a portal. So you can keep portaling back to deposit any mats and have easy access from your base if you do die in the process of clearing the dungeon. Okay, so now I'm going to clear out this dungeon and hopefully you guys can pick up a few tips along the way. So I'm going to take it slowly. Just waiting to see what comes around each corner. And I'm going to mostly stick to bow and arrow. See, they're all just starting to uh, pile up near the entrance now. This is quite a common thing that happens. If you just stay right by the entrance, sometimes they get aggroed and start trying to run towards you. Um, also, as usual, sledgehammers are actually really good for clipping through walls. So you can actually take care of enemies on the other side of any barriers or any steps down like this. All right, now they get close. We go with uh, parrying. And we just uh, keep rinsing and repeating. We know there's a tick there. So we switch to the pole arm. And maybe we just bait it. Let's try and avoid this seeker. Let's go with bow and arrows whilst it's not right next to us. Try and bait the tick again. Focusing on the secondary attacks with the pole arms. Um, we can see these pile of broods here. So we're going to throw some bombs down near these broods. There's a brood there that's not getting caught in the uh, AOE. Um, now once you're in here and you start looting stuff, you can start collecting these fragments as you see them. This is obviously one of the things you're going to need to find. All right, so there's another seeker there. I'm playing it super safe here, by the way. You don't need to play it this safe, but just for demonstration purposes, uh, we're going to be going back to the entrance. Um, and I'm just focusing on any doorways that are open to start with. I've got another fragment there, so that's really good. Now, if you use poison bombs at these types of barriers here, the effect of the poison will actually clip through the barrier, which allows you to uh, defeat enemies from safety. Another way bombs are now super, super useful. Um, if you use fire bombs, however, um, oh, if you actually hit the barrier, you'll actually see it break down. Look, if you hit it with fire bombs, parry this guy. I saw a tick, so I'm just changing to the pole arm for the tick. And uh, yeah, this is really good. This is a black core. So you're going to need black cores for a few of the recipes as well. So this is what they look like. It's one of the reasons you're going to need to know how to clear dungeons effectively. Um, also, you've got piles of royal jelly here. So you do actually get quite a lot of royal jelly from these dungeons. 
So I'm not going through any barriers yet. I'm focusing to open areas because those are the ones that are going to rush us. Um, I'll just pop this new lingering potion. This restores stamina passively. Um, I'm going to throw this bomb on these broods. Taking care of all the broods there very nicely. And uh, yeah, it looks like almost cleared out all of the open areas of this dungeon. I focus on any open areas first without opening any doors because if things get out of hand, it's the open areas that are going to overwhelm you. Anything behind the door is obviously not going to rush through. Uh, so we've actually got a soldier here. So we're going to do the combination of bombs on this guy. I'm going to spam a few extra fire ones. And whilst he's getting those damage ticks, I'm going to fire some arrows. I can't even see his weak spot, but just look. If we get all those damage ticks at the same time, we melt those soldiers. Uh, basically, no matter what skill level you are with your character, by the way, when you make a video like this, you always get comments saying, oh, yeah, well, that's really easy when you're on level 100. Even if you're not on level 100. <laughs> um, again, that's never actually true. Um, this is a debate that lots of less experienced players try and get into in the comments. Um, but as long as you're, I would say, above level 20 or 30 with the skill levels for whatever um, weapon types you're focusing on. Most of the time, you're still going to defeat enemies in the same amount of hits or perhaps just an extra hit. It is far less of a deal breaker than people realize. I've played this game for thousands of hours, multiple world records in a speedrun. No speedrunner gives a shit about skill levels for this reason. So I promise you, it's not about the skill levels. It's much more about taking it easy being prepared, not rushing in, and uh, just knowing the right strats, basically. Okay, so this is good. We've got one of these barriers here. So for this, I'm going to use a sledgehammer. It's a really useful way of clearing out any dungeon in the game, really, because it clips through walls. Um, this is just the iron sledge. If you use the demolisher, it's extra effective. Side note as well, you actually stun seekers with doing these. So you can then just fly in with a melee attack. The hammer still works pretty good for clearing off ticks, by the way. Also a good option. A single bomb to deal with all those broods. So we've got another soldier here. So I'm going to start throwing in bombs. We've got a seeker coming at us here. Um, but they are struggling to get through this door. Oh, okay. So, multiple enemies ganging up on us. Hammers are pretty good when you're being ganged up on. I'm going to get my shield out. Oh, this seeker is actually stuck behind a wall again. Okay, now let's go with multiple bomb types. Some extra fire ones. Force the bow on the soldier again. And we really start to get that insane DPS. There we go. Easy peasy. Oh, the seekers are getting very angry at us here. So that's that room cleared out. Oh, no, it's another seeker. It's going to wait for this one to land and we'll just parry him. Oh, we stunned him there. More royal jelly if you need that for recipes. More black cores, more fragments. This is actually an excellent, excellent dungeon so far. I personally like to go around with auto collect turned off in this scenario, clear out the dungeon. And then just go through my portal, dump my weapons, 
and just run around and collect everything afterwards and go through my portal. I find that's a pretty efficient way. I'd rather be overprepared weapons and gear wise and not have space for loot and actually not die. Basically ever. And then just have to go through a portal to stash my loot. Then die several times over. Perhaps have to make a longer journey. All right. We're back upstairs going through some of these other doors. Um, we know the Seekers at the other side of this place. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, the fire bombs will actually break. Those just wooden barriers uh, that are just covered in vines. Um, we're low on arrows. But it doesn't matter. We can just throw bombs down. Combining both types of bombs is a really good way of dealing a lot of DPS. Change the ball on for the tick. This one almost got us off guard. We'll parry this guy. We've got more ticks coming. So more pole arm action. We'll use the tasty meat there to quickly get to max stamina. Something else of note. You have these sort of secret rooms that look like this. Inside the dungeons. And sometimes they have treasure behind it. Sometimes it's just more dungeon. But it can be easy to miss if you're not always scanning the walls. So these are the other type of rooms that you can get behind these hidden doors. Ooh. We got super lucky. This one actually has the queen Vegvisir inside. Uh, so this is actually super rare. But these also spawn in black cores. And these chests which now actually contain potions and sausages. And obviously some gold as well. Lots of gold in fact. So that's pretty much everything about dungeons. Okay, so next up we're going to talk about clearing out the Dwarven settlements. You're going to have to do this to get access to the Dwarven Extractor. Generally, I recommend trying to keep your distance and using ranged attacks, either with the bow and arrow. But also, especially if you can get high up like this, dropping bombs down can be really, really effective. This is actually one of my favorite ways to deal with it. So yeah, we've got a really awesome vantage point here. You might not always be able to get one like this. So this is kind of a lucky spot, but we're going to capitalize on it. But I will show a few approaches to clearing out these Dwarven settlements. I'm going to get a little closer. So yeah, the bow is also really good for this. I mostly use frost arrows for this as well. Um, but yeah, you can actually do this totally from safety. I've seen some people recommend just taking them out uh, one at a time or at least trying to. Um, but actually, there's no real need for that as long as you just stay at range. And if you find a vantage point that's far enough away... You can actually do a lot of this pretty much from safety. Still got a few left here. So I'm just going to get a few bombs going. When there's only like one or two walls left, it's not really a huge problem. So that's one option, but you can also try and kite Seekers into the Dwarven Settlements. This can actually be really, really effective. Right here we've kited a Seeker Soldier. So we're going to see if uh, this Seeker is enough to win the fight. And if not, we'll try and kite some extras in. It's worth noting that sometimes these Dwarven Towers can spawn right next to the infested mines. If you ever see that scenario, 
I highly recommend capitalizing on just leaving all the Seekers alive and try and just lead them all over. So the Seeker's doing a pretty good job, but it's looking like it won't be able to defeat all of the uh, dwarves. There is a Yarl over there we could always try and kite. Oh, weirdly enough, we've got a mage that's decided to come over to us. <laughs> so uh, let's show him how much of a mistake that was. Oh, it's not going to matter. Because the Seeker is going to clean up. Alright, so that actually worked out pretty nice. The Seeker Soldier wrecked all these dwarves. This actually can happen more often than you think. Um, but we're actually going to check to see if there's any more dwarves left alive. It sounds like there might be. It's also worth noting, by the way, that at this point you could just take the extractor. We've got a mage here, which doesn't seem to have seen us yet so we're able to sneak up and take that guy out dwarves can drop soft tissue like marble gold uh, and also uh, some of the uh, blue jute as well anyway looks like we've successfully cleared this one out just with the use of this one seeker soldier but you can do this exact same thing with regular seekers as well um, but you do have to get a little bit lucky So now let's talk about how to defeat the boss. For this part of the video, I've decided the best way to demonstrate this is for me to actually try and kill the boss without dying for you guys. Trying to explain all of my thoughts and my strategy throughout the fight. Um, but first, I want to go over the gear that I've chosen to use for this fight. I've actually done this fight without dying several times with this gear set. So starting with the first slot, I'm using the carapace buckler just for that parry bonus. So I can quickly parry any Seekers that get too close and then finish them off with a black metal sword. Using the spine snap for my bow, just for those ranged attacks with the arrows. And of course, arrow wise, I'm gonna be mostly going with the frost arrows, but I'm taking a little bit of poison arrow and fire arrow so we can keep the elemental ticks going. I'm using the frost staff. I prefer using this staff on the boss fight compared to the other staffs because of its higher DPS and each shot requires less ether to use. So anytime we're actually at distance and in a safe spot and we have line of sight on the boss, we're gonna be chipping away at the boss's health for as long as we can. Then we've got bio bombs and ooze bombs. We're gonna be throwing these at the boss as often as we can because we want as many elemental damage takes going on as possible to keep that dps up this is actually going to dramatically reduce the length of time it takes to kill the boss and that's why i've got a hundred of each bomb type then we've got the big health potions we've got basically two stacks of those tasty mead to restore stamina when my stamina mead is on cooldown stamina meads so we can quickly run away if we're low on stamina. I'm taking the dead riser. Mainly just to use when I first go in. Because the skeletons can actually distract the boss. And allow us to get a lot of ranged attacks in. And then level 2 carapace helmet. Level 2 carapace greaves just for the armor values. The feather cape is really useful in this boss fight. Because you want to keep running away as much as possible. And go for as much ranged attacks as possible I find. And so this can lead to a lot of falling off the edge. Because it's actually quite a vertical boss fight. And I'm actually using the Aether Weave Robe. Because it boosts your Aether Regen. Which helps when using the staff. And we've also got these Minor Aether Meads. Which restore our Aether Bar. Which will also help with the staff usage. The Wisp Light because it can still get Misty in there. And then for food. We've got the Honey Glazed Chicken because of the high HP. And then just two of the best either food which is the seeker aspect and the Yggdrasil porridge just so we have a decent enough ether bar to get a lot of dps in with the staff 
Now, this may seem like a pretty low HP food combination, and that's because it is. But with this approach, we're going to be trying to keep our distance as much as possible. So hopefully we won't get hit that much anyway. I'm also going to be going for rested and going in with the bone mass buff. All right, let's go for it. I'm going to start with summoning my skeletons. Just filling up my ether meter. I can't actually see the queen yet. Oh, we found her. All right, so let's start out by getting those poison. And fire attacks in. Taking care of any seekers that are close by. Like I said, my approach here is to really just get as much DPS going as possible. It's kind of a lot going on. But in this scenario, I'm going to be kind of running away a lot. And whenever I have ether, I'm going to try and capitalize on our ether usage. Always trying to stay away from the boss. And if I see that she's not actually taking damage ticks, making sure I always get some bombs in there. Just so she's always got some damage ticking away on her. So we are out of ether now. So we're going to be going to arrows. Oh, took quite a lot of damage there. I actually haven't used my bone mass yet, so now's a good time to use that. Boy, she's been quite fast now. Trying to restore some stamina. And take out these Seekers whilst they're getting close. Right. We don't want her to ever be recovering HP. Because whenever you're not doing damage to a boss in this game, they do gradually restore HP over time. Which is another reason why bombs are really good. Because on this boss fight, you'll find that a lot of the time, you're having to avoid damage. And if you spend more time avoiding damage than dealing damage, then there's a pretty good chance it's going to take you way longer to defeat the boss. Because if there's too much time in between the times when you're attacking. Then uh, she's just going to out heal you. So it's one reason why bombs are really useful. Be consistently dealing damage. You can see as well a lot of the smaller mobs. also take a lot of damage is that her over there you can see that she just went away i think she's closer than we think here yeah there she is okay again just relighting those ticks Trying to get as much shots in with this staff as we can. So we are taking hits here. If we ever get in danger, by the way, we can always just drop down. Because of the feather cape, it does help a lot. Um, our bone mass buff is actually being very useful for us right here. Whoa! Bit 
Crazy meat. I don't see her, but... Yeah, she's right there. I think she maybe got away. Sometimes you have to take a bit of a stab in the dark, quite literally. <laughs> to guess in a location. Um, so whenever we get this chance... To be dealing damage with the staff from safety or try and take it. Ideally, we would do that while she's also getting elemental pixels for the highest amount of DPS. Oh. Man, I was actually had to just check right there if we're actually even taking damage. But yeah, this bone mass boss is actually kind of insane. So far. I can't see where the boss is at right now. It does seem like we're hardly taking enemy damage right now, but that will change a lot once uh, our bone mass wears off. Oh god. It's not good. Right, we're down at the bottom now. It would have been good to have dropped off at one point there, probably. Let's try and go up a bit. Whoa! She came up super close to me then. Right, this has been way too long without dealing any damage. Always staying aware that you need to constantly be dealing damage is a really key factor in the success of any boss fight in this game, really. But this one in particular because of the giant health bar that she has. Uh, one strat that I feel like is worth mentioning is uh, making sure that you're actually always heading upwards can get you in a situation where you're always going to have the option to escape by just dropping off okay so you can see that it's actually quite common Oh, we've got a save there, which is weird. It's actually quite common to be in a situation um, where you can get damage in with your staff. But at that moment, she will also um, start to spew poison at you. Um, so, oftentimes... The moments where you're able to get your most damage in are quite short-lived. Um, another thing I really want to mention during this boss fight is you might notice that I'm completely avoiding corners. I just never ever put myself in a situation where I might end up getting cornered because it's actually a huge problem during this boss fight to be cornered. She sounds pretty close. She is close, so she's trying to... Ooh. You see, these bombs, again, are just so valuable. Because you can also get a lot of damage in whilst you're on the escape. And this boss, more so than any others, 
is largely about just trying to always be dealing damage because there's almost a guarantee that it's going to be a long fight. Um, and yeah, we can stop and fight a lot of these enemies, by the way. But that is also going to just increase the chances of us getting ganged up on. Uh, I'll just refill in up oh, my bombs. Um, so in these kind of situations, oh, she actually just went underground. Oh no, she came back out over there, look. In these kind of situations, it can actually be hard to hit her with anything other than arrows, by the way. Um, oh, she actually fell down then. Uh, which is why it's worth it to me to have both bow and arrow. And... Um, Okay, I'm going to use my health potion right now. I'm trying to not overuse health potions. Okay, she's quite a bit closer than where she was just at. So that's why I'm going for the staff. When she's a bit further away, sometimes it's not really worth going for the staff. So it's quite easy to miss. All right, let's get those damage ticks in. But run away from that poison in the meantime. I think she went underground again. I see a brood there. Maybe try and get that. There she is, look. Let's try and get rings attacks. It's good to get poison attacks in. Uh sorry, like bomb attacks and uh Bow bomb and use bomb attacks from range, but it's actually easy to miss at that range. So, typically, just try and go for staff or arrow when she's really far away. Seekers are actually one of the biggest problems in this fight if all you're doing is running away because they really will hunt you down. Um, oh, that's a perfect spot for staff damage that is a nice chunk of damage we just did at some point she probably will reappear pretty close by so I'm not rushing in I'm just being patient um because she can make her way over to you pretty quickly the fact that I can't see her makes me want to Throw bombs in places where we have no vision. Alright, I see her now. It's actually kind of nice when you can get her in this routine of just staying on the stairs and trying to lunge at you. Uh, bombs can be quite a useful way to find her location. Okay, always making sure that I'm staying top top with food. Whoa, dude. All right. Going a little bit too long without dealing enough damage here. We, we don't want it to uh, be healing too much. It'd be easy to coast by when it's safe, but actually you need to make sure doing as much damage as possible this is a little bit low damage all of this huge amount of time here that we spent not doing any damage accidentally used a potion there but she just keeps falling down which you know is, is a safe thing but it's really just going to make it so it takes forever to so get through the fight and the more you extend the boss fight more likely all your stuff starts to run out and all your gear starts to break so we're actually going to move in a little bit closer you might notice by the way it's one of the top things 
that you might see other speedrunners do is uh, switch to the hammer instead of unequipping because there's no animation when you uh, switch to the hammer which means that you can get the extra movement speed of moving without having to carry a weapon um, without having to stop to unequip the weapon which can get you out of some sticky situations right so I'm pinned now I'm going to try and roll and roll and fall and then we're just going to focus on falling down all the way to the bottom. We know we're in a dangerous situation here. We can uh, throw some bombs to uh, make our position a little bit safer. The entrance is a pretty safe place as well. Um, so I'm going to stay topped up on stuff and just wait here. Get my shield out. And any second now. We will be able to use our health potion. There we go. So we're using our bombs in this moment. Now, now we've healed. I'm just gonna run away. I'm actually gonna try and just run all the way back up to the top. Um, there's a good chance he cuts us off though. Yeah, here we go. So now we can fall down again. And uh, now we're pretty much good. We've recovered and we've not got too many enemies piled up in one spot. I'm a little bit lost though. It can be easy to get lost downstairs, I find. Um, when you're being chased by enemies, throwing bombs is also like a really solid thing to do. Right, I know she's over there, so we're going to run in the opposite direction pretty much. Just trying to stay out of the way, chip away damage with bombs. Right, now, now we're in a solid spot again. Even though I've lost her. <laughs> Let's see the Seekers. Ow. Ow. Alright. One of the reasons why I'm using bombs so much as well is because it's actually just a really passive way to uh, be dealing damage to the mobs that are after us that allows me to mostly just focus on doing damage to the boss okay here we go this is going to be a good lot of damage Can't quite see it down there. <laughs> so that was a good example of how to get out of a sticky situation using all the strats and stuff that we've uh, talking about during this fight so far. Sometimes it's worth tanking some hits, by the way, just for the sake of dealing damage to the enemies you're surrounded by. Getting rid of one really quickly and taking a little bit of extra damage. If that makes it so you can get rid of the other one very easily, it can definitely be worth it in scenarios like that. Yeah, now we've got a trapped in a really nice spot. So as you can see, like capitalizing on the right time to be able to use this staff. It's something that's not necessarily always present. Like if we just stand in front of a doing it, we are just going to get wrecked.
Right, I'm actually going to try and get back up there now. I don't want to get too far down. I find the actual entrance area is one of the most dangerous areas. The very, the very first spot by the doorway is a great spot to stay safe. But um, the actual bit with all the pillars and the holes where the seekers come out, I actually find to be a terrible spot to be in. <laughs> right, we don't want to get trapped in the corner. She's actually a nightmare for trapping you in the corner. So I'm going to drop back down. Down for food, potions, and then I'm going to mostly just run away whilst throwing bombs on the ground now. Um, try and get some height advantage as soon as we can. I'm waiting to be able to use a stamina potion because... Oh, actually, we might be able to just use a tasty mead now. I've got rid of those seekers. It's going to say with a seeker on your tail, tasty mead's not like super interest, uh, super useful. We should just end up standing there and taking loads of damage. So many broods around right here. What's happening? Here we go. There she is. And we've been gradually wearing her down this whole time. See, we're getting very close now. It's not a time to get careless, though. That is the perfect scenario of if you just backed into a corner there, you'd just be dead pretty much. See the seekers coming, so it will bow and arrow out ready. She went away. That's annoying. Well, basically, you just stick to the entire same set of strats for the whole boss fight and just be patient. And it's really just about avoiding damage. Oh, we've got our bone mask back as well, which is great. It's about avoiding damage, but also constantly dealing damage. Oh, God. Actually didn't mean to fall down that one time, but I am after this gonna show you a way to cheese this fight. There is as the way currently stands. A way easier way to do all of this, but this is a conventional way. Uh, and honestly, this way is super fun to me. I absolutely love it. I'm just going to tank it at this point. Boom. There we go. She's dead. Obviously, it's not officially over. So you survived the whole thing. Technically, right? Seekers are just chilling. There we go. A few broods left. But that is it. That is officially the Queen boss fight. So I hope you got some tips from this. I hope you found it useful. Here's the giant crazy queen trophy. Next, I will show you what this trophy does, what ability it gives you. But before that, I want to show you a cheeky cheese for how you can cheese this boss fight. So let's do that. Okay, so this is the official way you can cheese this boss fight. You can come into the room and aggro the boss just by shooting her with a bow. 
And if you hide behind this wall and stay in this exact spot in this left corner, any of the sledgehammer type weapons will actually deal damage to the boss through the wall. Right now, I'm demonstrating this with the demolisher. But any sledgehammer weapon will work. This is just the new best type of sledgehammer weapon. Uh, if you do this with max stamina food and rested, uh, you can actually get through this really quickly. You will have to repair your hammer uh, once if you use rested, probably twice if you don't. Um, but yeah, you can actually kill the boss this way. Uh, and I've tested this a load for the speedrun because um, this is a pretty good speedrun strat. And uh, it works super consistently. Um, I've seen people bring this up and say about having to fight off enemies. But actually, if you stay jammed in this left corner like this facing the wall, I have found that extremely consistently you do not get attacked by enemies. So you can actually do this really, really safely. Uh, and obviously, yeah, it's faster if you go with like max stamina food and uh, max rested as well. But this is a totally viable way to kill the boss right now. Uh, that's super easy. Let's see if this gets patched or not. I kind of hope it doesn't. <laughs> But uh, if it does, it makes sense, right? I kind of hope it doesn't because I think this is actually a super fun thing for the speedrun right now. But uh, obviously, it totally makes sense if they do want to patch it. I'll understand if I had to figure out another way around. I just thought it was a cool trick to show you guys the purposes of this video. So the buff for the Queen Forsaken Power is faster mining and increased ether regeneration. Next up, I want to show you guys all of the new build pieces in the update. There's actually tons to get through here and lots of it there isn't really that much to say so I'm just going to let the build pieces speak for themselves and then afterwards I'll show you guys an example of something cool that I built with some of the new pieces. So this is a build that I've done with some of the new black marble pieces. I really like all of the new angled pieces and new pillars. It really allows for a whole new style of architecture. And I really like how this build kind of looks like some kind of weird ancient temple. Just by being able to do some different shapes. And I really love how you can really make some cool looking doorways now. But yeah, there's a ton of new potential, as you can probably see with the new build pieces. I do feel like it's worth noting in particular that these lanterns don't go out, which for a lot of people will be a huge deal. People actually install mods just so they don't have to keep collecting resin. So I think that's actually a really awesome addition. But uh, anyway, this is just a little example I wanted to show you. There's also been some changes to the trader in the update. You'll notice now that if you go to visit Haldor right near the beginning of the game, he won't be selling all the items that you used to see in. Now, as you beat bosses in the game, new items unlock at the trader. To get the Thunderstone, you have to defeat the Elder. To get the Ymir Flesh, you have to defeat Bone Mass. And once you defeat your glove, you get a very special new item, which is a chicken egg. So now I'm just going to demonstrate everything I just described with a few commands. So the egg costs 1,500 gold and with it you can actually farm chickens. 
which brings us on to the next part of the video okay so the way chicken farming works is first of all you want to build some kind of structure to protect your chickens and then you just place the egg on the floor and this actually works slightly differently to other items because you won't auto collect the egg then if you mouse over the egg you can see if it's warm or not so what you need to do is put a heat source nearby i recommend putting a fire on the other side of the wall i like to use a bonfire because rain won't put it out and obviously you don't want to put the fire anywhere where the chickens might walk onto it as long as the egg is warm, it will eventually hatch into a chick. Chickens actually see one here. It does take a while at first to hatch. And you will need two eggs to start your chicken farm so they can breed. The process seems slow at first, but as soon as you get a couple of chickens on the go, they do start to multiply pretty quickly. Anyway, once your chicken is hatched, eventually it will grow into a hen. Oh, that was good timing. And then the hens will eventually lay new eggs. And then those eggs will hatch into chicks and the cycle continues chickens do however need a food source and they will eat any seed type except for turnip seeds so as you can see i only added this one egg for demo purposes and even just in the short period of time we've been in here one of our hens has laid an egg so like i said it's a slow start but once things gets going it's pretty quick you are also going to need a butcher's knife to kill your chickens, just to show you. Can't actually damage them. And just to show you what the chickens actually drop, I'll slaughter one for you. And they drop chicken meat and feathers. So chicken meat is a really good food source. It's actually used for one of the best recipes in the game, which we'll show later. Um, but this also gives you an infinite supply of feathers as well, which is really cool. As well as chickens, you can now farm mushrooms with the Mistlands update. For this, all you need is a cultivator and one of the new mushroom types, whether it's a Jotun Puff or a Mage Cap. However, it is worth noting, they do not grow in any other biome except for the Mistlands. So you're going to have to plant them in the Mistlands biome. And they also need sky overhead, just like the other stuff you can farm in the game. And it's also worth noting that each mushroom type, once fully grown, will develop into three of each mushroom. So this is a really good way to stock up on tons of mushrooms, which will be useful to craft some of the new recipes. There's also been some pretty big changes to fishing in Valheim. Now, when you catch a fish, it no longer turns into raw fish. Instead, you get the entire fish in your inventory which corresponds to one of several new kinds of fish that you can find scattered across the ocean. And these fish can also be used to craft specific new baits. So how this works is that there's now generic fish, which are the ones that we're used to seeing everywhere. And those can be caught using the usual bait that you can buy from Haldor. But then there's some of the more unique fish, which change depending on which biome you're in that require one of the new baits. So I'm now going to go through all of the bait recipes. We have a cold fishing bait, which requires one tuna and one Ulv trophy. The current build on the public test server does swap the Ulv trophy for the Fenring trophy. So it changes the recipe to one tuna and one Fenring for the cold fishing bait. So I just wanted to include that just in case that change does actually happen. Hot fishing bait, which requires one angler fish and one Sertling Trophy. Sticky Fishing Bait that requires one Trollfish and one Abomination Trophy. Stingy Fishing Bait which requires one Giant Heron and one Fueling Trophy. Heavy Fishing Bait that requires one Pike and one Serpent Trophy. Misty Fishing Bait that requires one Grouper and one Lox Trophy. Mossy fishing bait that requires one perch and one troll trophy. And one frosty fishing bait that requires one magma fish and one drake trophy. First of all, you probably noticed that all of these require trophies, which adds an awesome new use to trophies in the game that were previously pretty much useless other than just decoration. Now, I'm not going to hunt down absolutely every single fish type in this video because that would take quite a while. But just to show you how the process works, we're going to go and try and catch a trollfish. 
So I haven't quite worked out which fish all the bait catches yet, but I have found that it's kind of pretty obvious just based on the recipe. This bait is called Mossy Fishing Bait. It says dead trolls in the forest often attract a fish or two. And you craft this with the perch and the troll trophy. And this is used to catch troll fish. So let's go and hunt some down. So here we are in the black forest where troll fish spawn. And I can see there's a school of troll fish here in front of me. So we're going to equip the mossy fishing bait. Let's see if we can't catch one of these troll fish. Okay, we've got one hooked. And boom. We officially caught a troll fish. The models for all the new fish, by the way, look so cool. And just to show you that you need specific bait, I'll equip the normal bait. So look, you get this notification saying it's not taking the bait when you use the wrong kind of bait. So if you see a cool looking fish anywhere just offshore, look for any recipe that uses a trophy from the biome that you're in. That's a pretty good hint for most of them. And oftentimes, just the name of the baits or the description is a little hint as well. Some of them, like Misty Fishing Bait, are actually really obvious. So look, you can see that we just managed to catch an angler fish there, which spawns in the Mistlands with the Misty Fishing Bait. To craft these baits, by the way, you're going to need to use your cauldron. And they do all seem to require station level one which is actually pretty convenient which actually brings us on to the next part of the video there is actually a new station upgrade to the cauldron called the mortar and pestle this means that your cauldron can now be up to level five which is required to cook some of the new recipes to make a mortar and pestle you'll need eight black marble six fine wood and four core wood so now let's go through all of the new recipes of which there is a lot so I'm just going to try and fly through these. And rather than give you all the stats, I'll just tell you whether it's a stamina, health, or magic food, and what value it gives you for the relevant attribute. So in no particular order, first up we've got salads. They're a stamina food that gives you 80 stamina and a 3 HP tick. They require 3 Jotun puffs, 3 onions, and 3 cloud berries. We've also got a mushroom omelette, which is also a stamina food that gives you 85 stamina and a 3 HP tick. And that requires three eggs and three Jotun puffs. Then we've got a cooked egg, which just requires an egg. This is a health food that gives you 35 HP and gives you a 2 HP tick. Next up, we've got Yggdrasil porridge, which is a magic food that gives you 80 ether and a 3 HP tick. This requires four sap three barley and two royal jelly next up you've got cooked chicken meat which is a health food that gives you a 60 hp and a 5 hp tick and for this you just need chicken meat next up we've got uncooked fish and bread this requires an angler fish and two bread dough and this will also need to be baked in the oven and cooked fish and bread gives you 90 stamina and a 3 hp tick then we've got cooked seeker meat cooked seeker meat is another health food that gives you 60 HP and a 5 HP tick. To cook these new meats, by the way, you'll need to use an iron cooking station. Next, we have an uncooked magically stuffed shroom. For this, you'll need three mage caps, one blood clot, and two turnips. This is a magic food that gives you 75 ether and a 3 HP tick. Then we've got cooked hair meat which is a health food that gives you 60 HP and a 5 HP tick. Then we've got an uncooked meat platter, which requires one seeker meat, one lox meat, and one hair meat. And the meat platter is a health food that gives you 80 HP and a 5 HP tick. We've got an uncooked mist hair supreme that requires one hair meat, three Jotun puffs, and two carrots. The mist hair supreme is a health food that gives you 85 HP and a 5 HP tick. Then we've got Seeker Aspic, which is a magic food that gives you 85 ether and a 3 HP tick. That requires two Seeker meat, two Mage Caps, and two Royal Jelly. Then we've got an uncooked Honey Glazed Chicken that requires one chicken, three honey, and two Jotun Puffs. And the Honey Glazed Chicken is a health food that gives you 80 HP and a 5 HP tick. That is actually it for all the new health recipes. However, there are a couple of new mead recipes. 
First up, we've got the major healing recipe. To make the mead base for this, you're going to need 10 honey, 4 blood clots, and 5 royal jelly. All these will, of course, have to be placed in a fermenter. Then we've got the minor ether potion. This requires 10 honey, 5 sap, 2 jotun puffs, and 5 mage caps. And finally, we've got the lingering stamina that requires 10 sap, 10 cloud berries, and 10 jotun puffs. Major healing will actually instantly restore 125 health, which is absolutely huge. Minor ether will instantly give you 125 ether, which is also a lot of ether. And the lingering stamina is particularly interesting because it gives you a passive 25 HP stamina regen bonus. So it's kind of like having an extra rested bonus just for your stamina. And the duration of this is five minutes. However, it's worth noting that even though this is a different kind of potion, you can't use regular stamina potions while the lingering stamina mute is active. There's also some new skills that have been added to Valheim. These work pretty much exactly how you would expect by simply increasing the effectiveness of using the relevant tools relating to each skill. We've now got a fishing skill, which is self-explanatory, blood magic skill, which relates to the new dead riser, an elemental magic skill, which relates to the frost and fire staffs, and a crossbow skill, which relates to the new crossbow, obviously. We've also got some new hairstyles, including curls one, curls two, gathered braids, neat braids, pulled back curls, royal braids, short curls, single bun, and twin buns, as well as some new beard styles, including braided four, braided five, royal one, royal two, short four, stone dweller, and thick two. We've also got a ton of new emotes, including blow kiss, bow, cower, cry, dance, which is absolutely epic, by the way, despair, flex, come here, headbang, kneel, roar, and shrug. We've also got some really cool new music additions, like the new Mistlands music, which includes a track for Mistlands exploration, for Mistlands locations, and the Mistlands boss. And all of this new music is absolutely awesome. And we also now have special music for when we're visiting Haldor. The music is also now more dynamic. For example, when resting by a fire, it will now change to better suit the mood. There's also two new events, including one where you get invaded by seekers called They Sort You Out, which gets super hectic. And the other one is called What's Up Y'all, where you get attacked by y'alls. And this one seems to only be triggerable in the Mistlands. However, it is for sure the thing of nightmares. <laughs> one of the other cool new things in this update is we technically have a new NPC in the form of Hugin's brother, Munin. I'm not going to spoil all of what Munin says, but I think fans of the lore of this game are going to love this. And I think he looks super cool. We do also have some really cool additions for base defenses, including this ballista, which you can craft with 10 black metal, 10 hydrosil wood, three mechanical springs, and a workbench. And to craft the mechanical springs, you're gonna need one refined ether and three iron. So to use this ballista, once you've placed it, you're actually gonna need some of the ballista ammo, which are the new missile items that we explained how to craft earlier in the video. Once you've got some missiles, you walk up to the blister and just press E to add them. And the blister will officially shoot anything within a 180 degree radius in front of it, um, including you, which uh, is kind of 
a weird twist. <laughs> but anyway, this is a really cool addition. And uh, I think this item is actually a lot of fun. We've also got some Dwarven Sharp Stakes, which require five Yggdrasil wood, two iron, and a black forge. And these actually look really cool. And these actually pair nicely with the new stake wall as well. And perhaps the coolest and most interesting addition for base defenses is the trap. You can craft this with five black metal, 10 bronze nails, and one mechanical spring. And you're going to need a workbench. And this is basically a giant bear trap. It works exactly how you would expect. Once it's been set off, you actually get stuck in it for a few seconds. And then you can reset it again by pressing E. And this will trigger from anything that walks into it. So I really think with the addition to the new base defenses, you'll be able to have an extremely secure base with the right build, which I think is super cool. So by this point, you've heard me mention several new mats that you're probably wondering how easy they are to get hold of. So let's talk about resources. So the two main resources you're going to be after for these new recipes are Yggdrasil wood and black marble. In the Mistlands, you do get this new tree type, which is called the Yggdrasil Shoot. And to chop this tree down, you're going to need a black metal axe. No other axe will do the job. However, if you're very lucky, you may be able to get a Seeker Soldier to chop it down for you. These trees are actually pretty plentiful. So as long as you have a black metal axe, you'll be absolutely fine. This is a side note. I think the model for the pieces of Yggdrasil wood is so cool looking. So we briefly mentioned this resource type at the start of the video, but these petrified bones in the remains of giants littered across the Mistlands are the number one source of black marble that you're going to find in the game. These do require a black metal pickaxe, but if you mine every last petrified bone you find, this will yield a lot of black marble. And remember, inside the brains, you can find all the soft tissue you need. All right, so we're almost at the end of this epically long guide, but there are a few more things I want to mention that didn't really warrant their own full video part, but I still think are important to let you guys know. So this is officially the miscellaneous section of the video. Your stamina level is now remembered when you relog, so no more relogging to get a max stamina bar. You used to be able to spam jump when going up really steep hills to kind of fly up mountains really fast. That has also been nerfed. There's been a few little terrain generation changes, mostly just to do with fitting in the Mistlands. And there's actually been some sort of height map changes in the Mistlands themselves. Fish can now spawn in ice caves. There's been multiple improvements to several of the animations and visual effects. The stamina drain multiplier when running uphill has actually been removed. So it used to be that the steeper the hill you were running up, the faster your stamina would drain. Now it actually always drains at the same rate, which I actually think this is a really nice change because stamina usage in Valheim is actually pretty intense anyway, and it could be kind of unintuitive if you was going uphill. So I think this is a good change. Knockback mechanics have been reworked a little bit. Axes now have a special attack, which is actually pretty cool. Some enemies now have weak spots, which we did briefly cover with the Seeker Soldier, but the Troll also has a weak spot if you shoot him in the head. There's also some new lore stones and new dreams as well. All right, guys, that's just about going to do it for this video. But before I wrap up, I just want to say thank you so much for watching to the end of this video. I know you guys are always eager to see more content from me, and you may have expected more from me over the last couple of weeks, but hopefully now you see that this video is almost the length of like a feature film. It's pretty clear where I've been spending my time. So this was a lot of effort, but I hope it helps because I really wanted to put something out to help returning players and new players and people that just appreciate a little bit more detail and don't want to have to just watch a ton of different videos to know everything about the update. But anyway, we're going to leave it there. So thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a like and a nice positive comment and subscribe for future content. I do actually stream live on this very YouTube channel and live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Nick So I'll leave a link in the description to my Twitch channel if you're interested in that. All the work I do here is actually completely crowdfunded. So if you would like to support the content and help keep my dream alive of being able to continue to do this and in return get access to a private Valheim server, then you can do so on Patreon at patreon.com slash Nick I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested in that as well. You can follow me on social media and join my Discord at the links below. And until next time, have a good one.